Thank you so much. That was very fascinating. Well, next we have uh, Magnus Norden. Magnus published his first game in 1983. And since then, he has spent 25 years doing computer science and software engineering in a large number of projects and companies. Uh, currently, he is working with deep learning and AI research in the gaming in industry as the technical director of Seed, which is an EA R&D division. So please welcome Magnus. So good evening. I'll try to okay. really keep decent time because everyone is tired, but uh, uh, hopefully it will be interesting. So I work at Electronic Arts, a big gaming company. Um, 29 game studios, 10,000 people around the world. And we recently started uh, an R&D organization called Seed. And uh, what we're trying to do is to look a bit further than the next game. Okay. Uh, so investigating the future of interactive entertainment, essentially. <clears throat> we uh, are working in four areas right now. Virtual humans, which is essentially trying to replicate humans in virtual worlds, like games and virtual reality. The deep learning part, which I will talk a lot more about here. We also have a prototype team that actually builds a lot of new games, both classical games and virtual reality. Uh, and we have a future worlds team that are trying to investigate how to build the game worlds of the future, procedural quantum generation and such things. So we have already seen Andrew talking about everything we can do with uh, uh, neural networks this morning. And uh, I, I won't go into detail here, but we can do text-to-speech, speech-to-text, we can create music, we can parse images, we can generate content, uh, and of course we can play games. So just like uh, Yuang Dong just talked about, we are also using reinforcement learning uh, for game AI. So if we compare graphics 30 years ago, this is a game from 87, and we look at a recent game like Star Wars Battlefront here, we see that a lot has happened. But if we think, think about uh, uh, game AI, it's mostly the same technology that's used uh, today that was used 30 years ago. It's behavior trees, essentially state machines, and a few other things. So graphics has moved much, much faster. Uh, so, I guess most of you know what reinforcement learning is. Uh, you have an agent acting in an environment, it can perform actions, it can see observations, what happens when it performs those actions. It gets rewards and punishments um, to learn from that environment. It also has a goal, it's trying to achieve something in the environment. Typically in a ga game, it's maximizing the score, but it might not be, because maximizing the score might not be uh, interesting for the human player. It might be to play in an interesting way instead. It's not fun to always be beaten. Uh, so learning by doing, essentially, the same way we learn and animals learn. So a super small, simple example of reinforcement learning. We have this very basic game. The blue guy is the agent the new, uh, run by a neural network. It's supposed to eat um, the green dots and avoid the red dots. So when we start out here, uh, it's, this is when it's completely new. It knows nothing. It's doing random movement. Uh, it, but it is getting rewards and punishments for the green and red ones. But it's not going well. You can see the score is going down. Um, but after just a few minutes of training, it's learned to, well, tries to hide in a corner, dashes out to eat some green ones. Uh, clearly uh, a much more intelligent behavior after just a few minutes. And if we look at the results after a couple of hours of training, it's, uh, it's playing superhuman. And this is the danger here. We, we don't want superhuman game AI. That's, that's no fun. Um, so, a couple of years ago, DeepMind started playing all these Atari games, and uh, this was a breakthrough in reinforcement learning, because these learn only from pixels, which was very, very hard before DeepMind showed how, how to do it, essentially. And of course, all the progress we have seen in neural networks made it possible as well. Uh, and this is amazing, but these games are 30 to 40 years old. A lot has happened uh, in those 40 years. 
And uh, as maybe not all of you in here are gamers, I will spend a minute to show you some recent games we have made. So a lot has happened in 40 years. So how do we take the same met methods that uh, DeepMind used uh, for the Atari games to play these games? Well, uh, and the environments are super complex. We can't jump directly into these modern games, but we can take one step at a time, and, and that's what we've started doing. So I'll walk you through a few uh, game play examples from prototype games. So here's an early example. Uh, all, all of the small guys on the picture here are neural network agents. <clears throat> this was an early experiment. They're not very smart, but their objective is to hold this piece of road here between the walls. And there's one guy from the north coming out from the opposite team. He's also a neural network or an agent. And let's see what happens. So, Total failure, what, what happened? Well, essentially they were ambushed, and it's not strange that they were ambushed. All of these agents, they just use vision. Just in the Atari games, they just use vision. They, they use a camera to see their world. But they didn't have hearing, so this is what they see. They see a 128 by 128 image. So to give them hearing, we, we thought of doing an audio system, but that was too cumbersome, so we just added this small 2D radar you can see in the lower left corner. We just slapped that on top of the 3D image, and we didn't do any changes to the, to the agent, but uh, it immediately pick, picked it up and, and started playing much better. So we have a small, little bit more advanced games. We have the green guy, that's the agent. There's just one agent in here. Uh, the red guys are classical game AI, uh, handmade game AI. Uh, the, the blue area is an objective. It's trying to protect the blue area, and it can pick up health and supplies. So let's see how it plays. So it's learned to move towards the, the blue areas and starts patrolling them, protecting them. Uh, it's not a very, go uh, very good uh, aim because it, it wastes a lot of ammo. Here's the first person view. Uh, we can see what it's actually seeing. And the, the blue areas move around. They only stay in a place for half a minute or so, so it has to navigate to new areas uh, all the time. And there's no navigation systems uh, in this bot. It's just raw visual input. It doesn't have, and the, the net here we can see it's, it's learned to navigate in quite efficiently. It doesn't bump into walls and other things. Uh, it moves uh, efficiently towards the objective and, and uh, defends it and starts patrolling. Uh, but it didn't learn to conserve ammunition. When it ran out of ammunition, it it, it, uh, it lost the game because it didn't figure out that I should concentrate on the green boxes that contain uh, new supplies. But we just let it run for another uh, 50 million steps and uh, we saw some new behavior. <clears throat> so here it is playing a bit better, its aim is better, now it's uh, out of ammo. So it starts ignoring all the enemies, it starts ignoring the objective, it just rushes to the green box picks up some ammo, and then starts defending again. Uh, we can take a look at this from uh, uh, the first, first person view as well. And uh, you can actually see the, num the ammo number in the top of the screen there, so it's 2014. It's soon running out of ammo. 
yeah, now, now it's out of ammo. So now it runs away, starts looking for, and you can see this search behavior. Uh, that's also new. It, it was a more efficient way to find boxes by rotating your head like that. Uh, so we don't actually know how smart this agent can be because we haven't run it for more than 100 million steps. But uh, it's the same small network, essentially the same, except for the resolution. It's the same small network that the Atari games were playing. So these small networks can do a lot, play complicated games. And another thing that's funny with this, uh, or impressive rather, the, that's the generalization. So here we drop exactly the same network, except for the action space uh, it can turn into a very simple car game, exactly the same. After just a few minutes, it's, it's lapping the track, the same agent that played the, the other game. So they generalize very well. Of course, there are lots of challenges. Uh, I won't go to them. Uh, we used vision here, learning from the pixels. In a real game, we need to use game state, internal variables, parameters within the game to make it much more efficient. How do we combine this with classical game AI? Uh, uh, we won't play a full game immediately. We will need, still need to, to have our current methods as well. How do we give designers control? They will want to control the agent and say, don't do that, do that instead. That's really hard today. And of course, execution. Uh, neural networks uses GPUs, uh, and they are typically busy with graphics today. I think that will change in, in future games. So let's look at some other machine learning use cases. Yeah, I don't want to talk about style transfer. It, it can be useful in some, some designs uh, in games, but this is um, an interesting thing. So physics simulation. So this is a machine learning method that has observed a lot of data from a real physics simulation and it emulates that physics simulation. So we see that this is uh, millions of particles and they are being, um, the machine learning method can uh, do the physics emulation in real time. It's 100 to 1,000 times faster than the actual physics simulation. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be useful for research, but it's good enough for games. Uh, another thing is that m today, 99% of everything in games is handcrafted but more and more will become procedural. It's becoming too expensive to, to make games, uh, so we will do procedural content generation much, much more. And of course, there will be a lot of player-generated uh, uh, content in the future. So if we look at just one example, so this is a, an, a recent paper uh, using an adversarial network that just looks on terrain. It looks on maps and learn, and the, the user can then uh, uh, create, uh, just draw ridges and rivers and peaks and uh, other things to uh, very quickly create, uh, in this case, a terrain. But we can probably use this for all kinds of natural uh, phenomena. <clears throat> yeah, and objects, we haven't come as far as 2D pictures, which can be uh, uh, really impressive results today. But uh, there's lots of research going on for actually generating 3D assets. And the, these generated words would be very lifeless if we couldn't fill them with interesting life. So we will also have emergent life or emergent behaviors in the games. So this is an example from DeepMind where they actually have this small character. It's trained from scratch. There's no imitation learning involved and the only goal for it is to move forward. It has to learn how to use its muscles uh, and joints to, to actually do um, uh, a locomotion behavior that uh, makes it run forward. It's not always beautiful and it's not always successful. <laughs> uh, but we believe we can use these methods to do procedural generation of, uh, of interesting creatures in games. Uh, so, yeah, and this is an animation that has actually learned from a human. This, has, this is uh, a kind of imitation learning. It has looked at hours of captured data. Capturing animation data is very expensive and time consuming. So in this case, a neural network that has looked at captured data uh, takes the environment in consideration, as you can see. It stumbles a bit there, and the controller motions into consideration and animates this character. And this is work from Daniel Holden at University of Edinburgh. It's uh, quite impressive. 
Another thing, we have already seen a lot of voice generation. Voice generation is also very interesting for games. If we can do great voice generation, we can generate new text in games and have characters speak them in games. So I won't show you voice generation because we've already seen that. But uh, we can also have a singing generation. So in this case, the input is the musical notes and the lyrics. So that's a singing uh, neural network. Another thing that's time consuming and uh, hard is face animation. So this is work from NVIDIA help? Research and uh, the right guy is captured with a lot of cameras uh, and the left guy is controlled by, uh, uh, sorry, the other way around. The, 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 the left guy is captured, the, the right guy is the neural network. And the only input in the neural network here is the voice, the audio signal, the raw audio signal from the voice and it uh, manages to learn how to animate the face. Uh, oops. Yeah, we can play the video. Are those Eurasian footwear cowboy chaps or jolly earth-moving headgear? This is my reality, and this is the reality of my people. NBC glad. Why? Fox TV jerks quiz PM. Listen up. The train yard warehouses is our main objective. Alexei, you and your men will do that. You have to go in and out very quick. I want you to get all the ammo and weapons that you can carry and come back as quickly as you can. You understand? So this, techno this technology will, of course, make it possible eventually to uh, animate in real time avatars in a game from voice only. So let's jump into the future, see what we can do with uh, uh, all of these technologies. So today, as you've noticed, a lot of games are violent. And that's, uh, that's a simple explanation is that violence is the simplest interaction to implement in a game. It's much, much harder to implement social interaction, for example. But when we ask around what people think, what's the most um, exciting game experience or more, most compelling game experience you've had? They, a lot of people say this. <clears throat> Moina walks up to you and says, that, that power you hold, that's strange and ancient. What are you? I'm a witch hunter. <laughs> <laughs> you hear a voice. It's the voice of the young woman following you. An offering of outsider oh, blood is I knew it! I it knew it! It cleans the palate. You see her flesh extend as her arms grow. So classical pen and paper role playing. So what are they getting here that they don't get in games? They get the social interaction, the human interaction around the table. And we can't do that in games yet. Of course, they have to imagine everything. They, they don't get any graphics. Some people try to imagine it by doing live role playing. It's not for everyone. Uh, and uh, we in the gaming industry tried to do role playing in what's called massive multiplayer online role playing games. They turned out like this. This is World of Warcraft. It's uh, not really social interaction. It's a very complex uh, uh, exercise in um, coordination, rather. So we kind of failed. But we want to take a look at what can we do with all this new technology to do something like role-playing, something we call true role-playing. <clears throat> so this is an experiment from our virtual reality group. So here's a human in virtual reality. And we had dressed that human up with some skins from one of our games. Uh, so we can skin people to make them look like, uh, well, anything really in, in virtual reality. If we take this skinning technology and combine it with another voice technology that I haven't shown you today, but it's called vo voice alteration or voice conversion. You can take your voice and sound like anyone else, male or female, any accents, any pitch really, uh, any quirks in the voice. So you can actually sound like another person. If you take that, we combine it with the face animation. This will open up uh, completely new possibilities. And I will show you a few scenes now. There's nothing special with these scenes, but we can absolutely not do them in games today. Uh, so you, you have to imagine that this, this is your friends and you in maybe virtual reality uh, uh, playing out the scene. Here we go. 
If you're gonna play with the big dogs, no fair. I'm in. That's you, Wexel. I'm in. in. <laughs> oh, Hilo. When are you gonna learn? <laughs> I just want to say it's been a while since we opened the books. And uh, in regards to you guys, Bert, Jerry, as a man of few words, I... Not few uh, enough, though, huh? No blood. No blood. Solo. No blood. So, like I said, there's nothing special with these scenes, at least not in a TV concept. But in games, these are impossible. But I think they will be, be become uh, possible in the future. And uh, games will change more in the next five years than they have in the last 45 years. Um, with these new technologies. Thank you. Thank you so much.